From the Sumire Foundation and Connor B. Judge Foundation, this is Demystifying NMO. Welcome. The Sumire Foundation for NMO and Connor B. Judge Foundation are excited to launch a limited edition podcast dedicated to discussing some of the most relevant science behind neuromyelitis optica spectrum disorder, NMOSD, related neuroimmune disorders, and autoimmune disease in general. Our goal, with the help of Chelsea Judge, PhD and scientific advisor with the CBJ Foundation, is to translate tricky science jargon into something every person can easily understand and do something about. Chelsea, can you tell us a bit about your scientific background? Sure, hi. I studied biology at Miami University of Ohio. After college, I worked as a research assistant in an immunology lab at Case Western Reserve University in Cleveland and fell in love with the subject. I decided to pursue a PhD in immunology, studying the role of the immune system in infectious diseases. I continued this type of research after I finished my PhD, spending a little bit at the Reagan Institute for Infectious Diseases in Cambridge, Massachusetts. What's really cool about the immune system is that you find it all over your body, and what you learn from one disease can in some way help shed light on the immune response in another. Wow, that's awesome. So if you started off with infectious diseases, how did you end up interested in NMOSD? I'm passionate about NMOSD and related disorders since my brother Connor was diagnosed with NMOSD in 2014 after a severe relapse caused temporary blindness and paralysis. My mom and I started the CBJ Foundation, much like the Sumire Foundation for NMO, to raise awareness and fund research related to NMOSD. I now work as an NMOSD advocate and am motivated to learn all I can about the science of NMOSD and share that knowledge with the rare neuroimmune community. I think it's super important for patients to be as informed as they can to make the best shared decisions with their healthcare providers. Thanks so much for sharing, Chelsea. Can you give us an overview of what we're going to learn about today? Today is a crash course on the basic science of autoimmune disease and NMO, and we'll discuss a number of key questions. So one, what is an autoimmune disease? Two, How does autoimmunity happen and why? Three, what is the basic immunology of NMO? That's a lot. We better get started. When I think of autoimmune disease, I picture the immune cells carrying out a war of some kind against their own body. How does that happen? That's a pretty accurate image. We don't know the complete details of how or why autoimmunity happens. Otherwise, I think we do a better job to prevent and treat these diseases. First, I want to highlight the great service our immune system does for us. It's basically the military of the body, on guard against any potential invaders, whether they be infections or cancer. Thinking of the immune system like a military, we need both ready, prepared troops with weapons, as well as regulation on when to go to war and when to stop fighting. The ready-to-go-to-war arm is the inflammatory component, and another arm is the regulatory role of the immune system. In healthy conditions, both sides are absolutely necessary. But I thought that inflammation was bad. It can become bad, but we do need that inflammatory capacity to help fight infections. Good inflammation helps win the, quote, wars against pathogens or invaders, ranging from viruses like hepatitis C, bacteria, fungi, and also cancers. This inflammation then gets cleaned up by the regulatory component of our immune system. This inflammation can become bad if the balance gets skewed and there's too much inflammation and not enough regulation to clean it up or keep it in check. How does this balance between inflammation and regulation maintained? The immune system has a lot of checks and balances to make sure that things don't get too crazy on its everyday mission to defend the body. We call these checks and balances on inflammation by a few names, regulation, checkpoints, breaks, or tolerance. What do you mean by tolerance? Hmm. So going along with this analogy of the immune system as a military, tolerance is encouraged when you're nervous about a potential invader or something you've never seen before, but they're posing no danger. Tolerance in the immune response is no different. It's putting a break on danger signals that might cause an immune cell to attack something that's actually posing no harm to the body. Immune tolerance means don't react. Okay, so our immune system is a balance between inflammation and regulation maintained by checkpoints. What are some of these checkpoints? So many. The immune system has a ton of redundancy in functions to make sure that if one thing goes wrong, there is some backup. The main form of regulation is aptly called central tolerance. 
Central tolerance is basically boot camp training, making sure cells know how to react appropriately to foreign invaders and how not to react to our own body. This process occurs when autoreactive immune cells called lymphocytes, think of your T cells and B cells, are deleted, aka deletion editing. Okay, so our top immune soldiers go through boot camp to make sure they're prepared to fight their disease enemies and not their allies. Mm -hmm. What are the other non-central regulation mechanisms? That's called peripheral tolerance. Let's break it down. First, antigen segregation, which is a fancy term for physical separation of some component of something that the immune system wants to react to. Two, energy. This is another fancy science word for exhaustion or inactivity. Basically, a cell is energic if it's functionless. So even if a cell is autoreactive, it doesn't matter because it can't do anything. So the body can separate the immune cells from what they want to react to, kind of like a timeout. The other process you mentioned called energy is like taking away an army's weapons. So they're functionless. <laughs> yeah, I like those descriptions. Other peripheral tolerance mechanisms are also interesting and can have some fun analogies. So the third one, clonal deletion. Doesn't that sound like a Star Wars term? When lymphocytes, remember, T and B cells, see a specific antigen or something that they think they have to react against, they become activated and they start spawning like crazy. They clone themselves and like a lot. This process is called clonal expansion. This is great in response to an infection, like the flu, when we want the immune system to go to war against the virus. And it's even better because some of these cells will stick around and remember those bad guys, or whatever the infection is. We call those cells memory cells. Crazy, right? But in an autoimmune disease, this obviously is bad to have a whole patroon of immune soldiers against some aspect of the body. So, enter clonal deletion. This can occur by killing all those clones to that potential auto or self antigen once they've been activated. Boom. Gone. Clone Wars Immune System Edition. <laughs> Does the immune system have any other savvy ways to prevent autoimmunity? You bet. There are also specialized regulatory cells that keep in check the autoreactive cells. They can quiet the autoreactive process. There is also a process called cytokine deviation. Cytokines are cell communication signals. So this means switching those cell communication signals from an inflammatory type seen in autoimmune disease to a more an anti-inflammatory type. So I've come up with five different mechanisms. Okay, just to recap, the immune system undergoes boot camp training called central tolerance to make sure the cells are trained to respond to the bad guys and not the good guys. Mm -hmm. Then just in case some immune cells try to go rogue, you mentioned five mechanisms that can create immune tolerance. So how does this complex system of checkpoints get out of whack and allow, the, and allow an autoimmune disease? So that's the trillion dollar question. This may be surprising to hear, but it's actually a common occurrence for isolated breakdowns of these checkpoints, even in healthy individuals, to occur. That makes sense, since your immune system is saving your life every day against constant mutations, ultraviolet ray damage, the weird things you eat, and bugs that want to get you sick, and more. Autoimmune disease results only when there are multiple severe breakdowns of these immune checkpoints, meaning the resultant amount or function of auto or self-reactive inflammatory cells has overpowered the tolerance mechanisms. We don't fully know how this happens, but there are definitely two main factors. So one, genetic predispositions, and two, environmental triggers. Both can disrupt this balance of the immune system. There are a number of genes related to the immune response that have been associated with the susceptibility of autoimmune disease, including NMO, multiple sclerosis, and potentially other neurological autoimmune diseases. But even these immune response genes that have the tightest association don't completely account for all the cases that we see. Yeah, I know that there are a number of environmental factors that seem to further trigger an autoimmune disease. Some of these include vitamin D deficiency, lack of sun exposure, so being further from the equator, high sodium diets, obesity, certain infections, UV exposure, and toxins. And also smoking, too. So in summary, thinking of autoimmunity as an equation... Autoimmune disease equals genetic susceptibility plus environmental triggers 
plus breakdown in checkpoints. What are the key immune system players in NMO? Really need to highlight here that we obviously are still learning a lot about the immunology of NMOSD, but what we do know now is really exciting. Overall, NMO is characterized by an immune war, so to speak, against key components of the central nervous system, which includes the brain, spinal cord, and the optic nerve in the eye. The main type of nervous system cell that seems to get damaged in NMOSD is the astrocyte, which is an important cell that provides support for the neuron. Myelin, the insulator of neurons that allows nerves to signal quickly, can also be damaged. These attacks lead to potentially severe neurological damage that we see in NMOSD patients, including blindness and paralysis upon targeting of the optic nerve and spinal cord, respectively. What are some of the roles of the immune system in this destruction of astrocytes and myelin in NMO? There are a number of immunological mechanisms that cause this kind of destruction in NMO. Here are the highlights. In at least the majority of NMOSD patients, B cells make autoantibodies. The most well-defined and observed autoantibody is the aquaporin-4 antibody. Aquaporins are water channels that allow entry into the central nervous system. NMOSD patients who have this particular antibody, aquaporin-4, um, otherwise known as anti-AQP4 or referred to as the NMO antibody or NMO IgG, these patients who have it are called seropositive. Sero refers to the serum, a component of blood where we find proteins like antibodies. NMOSD patients who do not have this AQP4 antibody are called seronegative, and they account for just up to about 20% of all NMOSD patients. We know that in some patients, B cells can instead make another autoantibody against myelin oligodendrocyte glycoprotein, MOG. MOG is a type of myelin protein, and so the target of this damages the myelin around a neuron. T cells can also help carry out this damage by directly attacking aquaporin-4 or MOG, supporting their B cell friends' bad behavior of making these autoantibodies, activating other immune cell soldiers, and making more inflammatory cell signals. A lot of inflammatory cell signals called cytokines, including one called IL-6 or interleukin-6, can contribute to this damage and perpetuate the inflammatory cycle and autoantibody production. Finally, the inflammatory cascade called complement can accumulate and lead to lysis or damage of central nervous system components as well. That's a lot going on. So we have B cells making antibodies against nervous system proteins, T cells contributing to the damage, inflammatory cell signals, and something called complement that does not sound so nice that also causes damage. It's very complicated, but this complex web of immune system and nervous system interactions gives scientists and clinicians a lot to study. And although this can seem overwhelming, I think it's actually very exciting. There are so many things to study, meaning so many possible outcomes. Yeah, I'm aware of a number of exciting potential treatments that seem to target certain aspects of the disease you discussed. So it's certainly an exciting time for the NMO community. The medical and scientific community has learned a ton and seems poised to better patients. That also means we have a lot to learn and discuss. I definitely can't wait to learn more, but first let's summarize what we learned today. 1. Autoimmunity is when the body's immune system recognizes and attacks some component of itself. If we think of an autoimmune disease as an equation, then autoimmune disease equals genetic predispositions plus environmental triggers plus severe breakdowns in all those layers of tolerance that we mentioned. 2. Complement, the inflammatory cascade, can cause havoc in NMOSD. 3. Cytokines, which can further cause inflammation. We also know that B cells make antibodies, which can lead to the attack of astrocytes and myelin in NMOSD. Smart and concise recap. I love it. Thanks. If you want to take some NMO action, visit the TSF and CBJ sites at sumirafoundation.org and connorbjudgefoundation.org. There you can help contribute to awesome researchers who are trying to find answers to many mysteries of NMO. You'll also be able to check out helpful images and a glossary of keywords that we talked about in this podcast. We'd also love for you to complete a survey on the podcast. How did we do? Did you learn something? What other content are you interested in? Would you like to get involved? Tell us what you want to hear. Music